Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Monday, everybody. I trust you had a relaxing weekend, and as always, have a productive week ahead. China's economy was supposed to see a strong rebound in 2023. In early Q1, the consensus was that after a bumpy but brief ending of zero COVID and opening up, China would ride the wave of consumption rebound and see a year of healthy growth. Now, after an initially promising start. Analysts and markets alike are not so sure. This recent observation captures the thinking of many. Quote, There was a lot of expectation that you would see quite a strong year in China. What we are seeing right now is fairly weak China recovery in terms of industrial production. We haven't seen domestic consumption really come through, and exports have been a problem. End quote. Industrial production and profits, property sales, and credit growth have all fallen short of analysts' projections in April and early May, according to official numbers. The slowing momentum has already hit markets too, with the price of commodities such as copper and iron ore falling. Stocks are down, and the RMB has weakened to more than seven to the U.S. dollar. And of course, none of this is helping business or consumer confidence either. Quote, confidence is a big problem for consumers. There are concerns about the future. Future, you don't really want to spend. Private investment is also very weak. You talk to entrepreneurs; there is still a reluctance to engage. End quote. Policymakers were hoping for healthy growth this year, so they would have the wiggle room to begin tackling some of the country's most pressing economic challenges and systemic reform needs. We discussed the fiscal local debt crisis a lot last week, so we will not unpack it again here. Though we should note that over the weekend, in a very rare move, the financial regulator of the important city of Wuhan, provincial capital of Hubei. Publicly exposed over 250 firms with debt to the local government and demanded that they immediately pay up. However, we do need to look at recent updates related to two other serious policy challenges. The first is the ongoing housing crisis. According to a recent note from Beijing-based firm Gavikal Dragonomics, housing sales in the country fell to 63 percent of their 2019 levels in April, down from 95 percent in March. Suggesting that the initial hope that the housing decline may have stabilized was premature. Local governments in some localities appear to be getting quite desperate to push up sales, according to a report from state-run financial outlet The Securities Times. Quote, in some Chinese cities, home buyers can now tap into the housing provincial fund and use it toward down payments. Twenty-nine cities have announced such a rule meant to make it easier for residents to buy homes. Home buyers have taken notice too. In Qingdao, home loans drawn from the housing fund grew 104 percent in April, compared to the same month last year. End quote. Of course, it's no surprise that many local governments who rely heavily on land sales revenue are pulling out the stops to support local household demand, even if it creates new long-term issues like financial instability. For example, over the weekend, U.S.-based New York Times published an article about the city of Nanchang, provincial capital of Poh, Jiangxi Province. Population four million. Writing, quote, Nanchang, once a symbol of China's growth, now signals a housing crisis. The country's prolonged real estate slump has exposed cracks in cities like Nanchang, where years of non-stop building have created too much supply. By one measure, nearly 20 percent of homes in Nanchang sit vacant, the highest rate among 28 large and mid-sized Chinese cities. End quote. The second serious policy challenge is historically high youth unemployment. We remember that officially youth unemployment hit a record of 20.4 percent last month. Since then, experts and commentators have been debating what exactly the problem is. Worth most admitting that the challenge in the broader labour market is quite nuanced. There are jobs in the economy, but there is a mismatch of skills. In a commentary last week, Chinese financial media outlet Yizhai argued that a better explanation of the high jobless youth unemployment rate might be the larger proportion of less educated young people in the workforce. The latest national census reveals that in November 2020. 
Approximately 60% of China's population aged 16 to 24 had no more than a high school education. This percentage increases to around 70% when excluding those who still are enrolled in school. Another popular Chinese financial media outlet, Tsai Xin, argues that the causes of the high youth unemployment are varied. Quote, they include the cumulative damage of three years of pandemic shocks, the lagging effects of contradictory policies for industries, cyclical unemployment brought about by economic downturns, the structural unemployment due to industrial upgrading. Young people, lacking professional experience, have been hit the hardest. End quote. More seriously, the other continues to explain in its special commentary, deep-rooted distortions in industrial mechanisms continue to impede the high development and smooth operation of the job market, magnifying all the aforementioned effects. Some have argued that the soaring youth unemployment rate is a result of the graduating class of 2023 entering the job market. Perhaps, too, there is not just a mismatch of skills, but also a mismatch of expectations. Nie Riming, a researcher at the Shanghai Institute of Finance and Law, said recently that young Chinese with degrees are seeking jobs in technology, employment and medicine, quote, but these industries are exactly the ones that have been growing slow in China in the past several years. Many industries not only did not grow, but also suffered from devastating blows. End quote. Next up, where is all of this heading? Hey guys, if you enjoyed today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. It's just me making these episodes every day. It's a lot of work, but your guys' support is a huge source of motivation. Subscribing and sharing is a huge help as well. And for those who can go the extra mile and help me keep the channel financially sustainable, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everybody for the ongoing support. So, as we said right at the beginning of today's video, from recent graduates to investors to policy makers and analysts, there appears to be no shortage of disappointment. For our purposes here, the recent observation of Robert Xing, chief China economist at Morgan Stanley, is most relevant. Quote, the question is whether recent sluggishness is a hiccup or if the government will need to step in with more support." End quote. Indeed, after all, as we have discussed in previous videos, it's too politically important for Xi, who has now entered his controversial third term, for China not to meet its growth target this year. What is unknown at this point, and what we need to know here, or would like to know at least, is will China achieve that goal through healthy growth or through unhealthy growth? Will China begin to re-engage with much-needed reforms and work through deep structural problems, or further kick the can of reform down the road, turning once again back to stimulus. And despite all the disappointment, analysts are still divided over which way it will ultimately go this year. Quote, We don't expect policymakers to unleash major stimulus, as the 5% GDP growth target is still well within reach. The second half of 2023 hinges on whether consumer, business and investor confidence can be rebuilt in time, as a persistent lack of confidence could eventually trigger a negative feedback loop that results in more prolonged weakness. End quote. On China Update, we follow macro developments day by day, week by week, quarter by quarter, and while it is important to understand the trees of any area, sometimes it's useful to take a step back and survey the proverbial forest with a longer-term perspective. So in today's video, I wanted to look at recent comments from Wang Tao, former chief China economist at UBS Group AG and former senior economist at the IMF, as well as a well-respected thinker on China's economy, who, in a recent interview, did just that. Wang warns that we should exercise caution when jumping to the extreme conclusions. The true trend, she argues, is likely more nuanced and complex. Quote, more than 95% of China's debt is domestic, financed by relatively stable domestic deposits. State ownership of most of the banking sector means the government can prevent banks from withdrawing credit or otherwise causing a credit crunch. And the fact that most of the debt is owned by the state sector also means that the government can exercise strong influence on debtors to coordinate restructuring. Evidence suggests that a growing share of debt is allocated to non-productive sectors. This means misallocation of resources, depressed corporate profitability and investment, and lower long-term growth. 
without market discipline to clear out the low returns or failures of investment, inefficient and wasteful investments will crowd out more productive and profitable ones. Wasted resources will eventually end up as non-performing debt, the cost of which will have to be ultimately borne by savers, for example, in the form of lower returns and interest rates. End quote. However, if Beijing policymakers cannot make the necessary structural reforms they need to to the economy in time, then even this more nuanced and modest picture could end up being overly optimistic. Whatever does ultimately end up happening, we will be following along, as we always do, here on China Update. That is today's video. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a wonderful Monday, a productive week, and I will see you all tomorrow.